Stop, you haven't subscribed to the channel yet. Subscribe now, we have new stories every day. Now let's go. My name is Bruno Randazzo. Most people consider me a despicable bastard. I run my own construction business and earned over $100 million last year. I am an excellent businessman and proud of it. Most of my workers are union members, which cost me more in wages and benefits. However, I make up for it by securing contracts I might otherwise miss out on and by avoiding work stoppages. I also have no problems with inspectors. There are rumors that organized crime representatives are involved with the union, but I know nothing about that. Some of my competitors have had accidents, equipment issues, and the like. I've been accused of many things because of this, but there has never been any proof. Of course, I am innocent of any wrongdoing. Some people even whisper that I was directly responsible for several deaths. Naturally, that is pure nonsense. Still, I find it advantageous for the rumors to persist. About 10 years ago, I found it necessary to get married for business reasons. I acquired a trophy wife. There was neither love nor courtship in this union. She was a very attractive and stylish woman who seemed interested in me at the time. I was quite a catch, so I had plenty of options. Unfortunately, I didn't choose well. Although she met all my modus criteria, she did not turn out to be a very loving wife. The only sensible thing I did was sign a strict prenuptial agreement. For the past four years, Betty has been trying to divorce me. Of course, she is after a lot of money. It seems she thinks that by portraying herself as a miserable witch, I'll be more inclined to leave her at any cost. Sorry, but it doesn't work that way. I was raised to believe that divorce is not an option. Bruno, I can't put up with this crappy marriage anymore. What the hell do I have to do to get you to divorce me? We discussed this before, and you know the answer. Come on, Bruno. Neither of us is happy, and there's no reason to perpetuate this misery. Get yourself a hobby or something. I'm not going to give you a divorce, and that's final. What if I file for divorce then? On what grounds? My lawyers will eat you alive. I haven't done anything that could justify it, and you know it. I don't hate you, I don't cheat on you, and I don't even verbally abuse you. Anything you come up with won't hold up. I'm afraid we'll be married until you're ready for social security. Damn it, Bruno. What if I cheat on you? Will you divorce me if I start sleeping around? No, darling, I won't. But I can assure you that a couple of your lovers will end up dead in this county very soon. Everyone will know, and they'll start avoiding you like the plague. You bastard, she snapped, turning and leaving the room. I couldn't help but admire her beautifully rounded backside as she slipped out. It swayed from side to side as she walked, her dark hair falling over her shoulders, swinging back and forth in time with the movement of her hips. It was a captivating sight. She wasn't skinny like many trophy wives. She was voluptuous and slender. If only her brain were as sharp as her tongue. I left that conversation behind, like so many others. I suspected she was up to something but didn't want to sit around and wait for it. All good things come to an end eventually. It was a simple brown envelope made of heavy paper, addressed to me with no return address. I examined it carefully because something seemed off. Finally, I opened it. Inside were about 20 photographs. They depicted my loving wife Betty having sex with a large Latino man. Quickly glancing through the photos, I sat down at the kitchen table with a cold beer. I very carefully laid out all the photos on the table. Surprisingly, I wasn't outraged. Instead, I found myself fascinated. Something was strange about them. The longer I looked, the clearer it became. Some of the photos had very clear traces of seminal fluid, eight of them to be exact. The fluid was prominently displayed, but I doubted that man could ejaculate that much eight times in a row. It was obvious all the fluid was released at once. Then I noticed the angles. A third person had been involved in the shoot because all the photos were well-focused and taken from different perspectives. None of the photos showed actual penetration. In some, they were touching hips but not engaging in anything explicit. I realized my foolish wife was faking sex and showing me the photos. They were so obviously staged that I couldn't use them as proof of her infidelity. Her lawyer would have made a mockery of me. However, if I had gotten angry, gone and killed the guy, I would have ended up in jail and she would have taken the money. Cunning liar. All right, I thought. Now who is this guy? I separated the photos to get a good look at his face. There were only four clear shots, but it was enough to recognize him. Carlo Quilla, a Portuguese man who moved here from Rhode Island about five years ago. He had tried to set up an excavation business in my area using non-union labor and paying much less than I did. He played the game but didn't make it. I pushed him out of business in less than a year. Betty knew I hated him for interfering in my affairs. I understood why she chose him. For some reason, he stayed even after losing everything. I was sure he would go back to Rhode Island. Well, I knew where to find him. What should I do now? I ran out of cold beer and went to the bedroom. 
Looking into Betty's nightstand, I found her 25 caliber Beretta. After a few minutes of consideration, I decided to use my old 45 caliber army pistol instead. I still wasn't sure what to do, but I couldn't stand being taunted. The drive to Carlo's house took about 30 minutes. A battered Chevy was parked in front of the house. After that, things got very lively. Around half past six, I returned home. I walked into the kitchen. Betty was sitting at the table, picking at a salad. I yanked open a drawer in the buffet, tossed in the 45 caliber pistol, and slammed it shut. There was blood on my shirt and pants. I took them off and carried them to the laundry room. After throwing them into the washing machine, I returned to the kitchen in my underwear. Betty just stared at me. What's the matter, dear? Do you have any problems? I asked. No, everything's fine. Do you want me to make you a sandwich? I'm going to take a shower and then head to Poros for some linguine. Don't wait up for me. As I was leaving the room, I noticed a slight smile on my wife's face. Everything was going exactly as she had planned. That evening at Poros, there were a few very important people, there almost always were. I approached their table and paid my respects, mentioning that I would be busy for a few weeks, but that everything would be fine. Then I took a table in the corner and ordered a bottle of Rosa Lancers. Portuguese wine seemed fitting for the occasion. I started with an antipasto. There was no need to rush, evening promised to be long. Around half past nine, they showed up, two detectives in cheap suits approached my table while two uniformed officers stood by the door. I smiled and stood up to greet them. Bruno Randazzo, you are under arrest for the murder of Carlo and Luisa Chia. You have the right to remain silent. His voice grew louder, but I couldn't hear what he said after that. They escorted me out of the restaurant in handcuffs and was smiling as they put me into the police car. What they didn't know was that my lawyer, John Ferry, was already waiting for us at the police station. The session at the police station went as expected. Mr. Randazzo, are you acquainted with Carlo and Luisa Chia? My lawyer nodded if I was allowed to answer and shook his head if not. This time he nodded. I knew Mr. Kija, but I never had the pleasure of meeting his wife. How did you come to know him? A while ago, he started a construction company in this area that directly competed with mine. He was in business for less than a year before shutting it down. So you had a grudge against him? No, he went out of business. I settled my grudge and moved on. When was the last time you saw him? About six months ago. Why do you ask? We believe Mr. Kia and his wife were murdered this morning in their home, and we have reason to believe that you killed them. My lawyer leaned over to me and whispered, say nothing more. Why do you think my client is involved? John asked. The Kia family was shot with a 45 caliber automatic weapon. We found shell casings at the crime scene, and the firing pin markings matched those on Mr. Randazzo's pistol. How did you come into possession of Mr. Randazzo's pistol? That's not important at the moment. Of course, it's important, and if I don't get an answer, we are leaving. We also have a shirt belonging to Mr. Randazzo with blood on it. We believe it's the victim's blood and are awaiting DNA test results. And how did you get Mr. Randazzo's shirt? We are not going to cooperate further until you start being open with us. Where did you find the bodies and do the bullets match those from my client's gun? We don't have the bodies at the moment. So we're dealing with a murder where no one has been found? That's very interesting. What else can you tell us? We found a car belonging to the Kia family burned to a crisp in the back lot of one of Mr. Randazzo's construction sites. Were there bodies in the car? No. Why did my client do something like that? Because of the photographs he received in the mail. I looked at John and shrugged. I haven't received any photographs in the mail, gentlemen. Either charge Mr. Randazzo now, or we are leaving. You don't even have proof that a murder was committed, so you have nothing to charge him with. We still want to know how you obtained the pistol and shirt you claim are connected to this mysterious crime. There was no response from the other side of the table. John and I stood up and quietly, without objection, left the room. After leaving the police station, we went to John Ferry's office. John, you know I'm being set up. It seems that way. Is it your wife? I think so. She really wants to end the marriage and I believe this is somehow connected. Bruno, if she gets you sent to jail, she can file for divorce and get compensation, even with a prenuptial agreement in place. Someone must have given her legal advice. I'll look into it. John, there's a lot more going on here than meets the eye, but I'm going to keep some things from you. Sometimes the less you know, the less likely you are to run into trouble. I'll tell you enough to defend me, but not enough to ruin everything. That complicates things, Bruno. What do you want from me? Just keep me out of jail and find out who's helping Betty. It was morning when I walked into my office and Joe Stampy was waiting for me. Joe held a unique position in my circle of business partners. He was the coordinator and fact finder. I knew why he was here. Bruno, give me the latest news. 
It's simple, Joe. My wife is trying to put me in jail so she can divorce me and walk away with the money. How is she going to manage that? She staged a fake affair with Carlo Kija and fed it to me, hoping I would blow my top and go kill the guy. Then I'd end up in jail and she could leave me. What made her think you'd fall for that? Stupid. I told her that if I ever caught her with another guy, I'd kill him. She knew I wasn't joking and is trying to use it against me. I don't get it. If that's the case, why is Frankie Donato still walking around the county? What are you talking about? Who the hell is Frankie Donato? Joe said nothing. He just sat there, then shook his head. Damn it, Bruno. I really messed up, and I'm truly sorry. What the hell are you talking about? We all thought you knew about Frankie and that you were okay with it. We couldn't imagine you were unaware. Come on, Joe. Spill it. What are you trying to say? All right, Bruno, but remember, don't shoot the messenger. I nodded at him. Frankie and Betty have been lovers for about 12 years. They were together before you got married and continued after. They meet at his place about twice a week. Frankie even boasts that he slept with Betty at your wedding reception before you took her to the hotel. You were drinking and having a good time while Betty was upstairs having fun with Frankie in her wedding dress. Why didn't I know about this? Joe, everyone thought you knew. It was common knowledge. They assumed you didn't care. Damn, I don't think I've even met Frankie Donato. How did she manage to hide this from me for 10 years? I don't know, but that's why, when you said you'd kill any guy she was with, I didn't understand why you just didn't kill Frankie. We both sat in silence for a minute. Bruno, what do you want me to do? Nothing, Joe. It's fine. Ferry is keeping the cops under control, and there's no chance this will go to court. I got a couple of aces up my sleeve. Tell everyone there's nothing to worry about. When I got home, my loving wife was waiting for me. What are you doing here? How did you manage to get free? How did you post bail so quickly? Damn it, woman, you're asking too many questions. They didn't have enough evidence to charge me with anything, so they had to let me go. No bail is needed. By the way, how the hell did they get my gun and shirt? Betty stammered a bit, clearly struggling to answer the question. I don't know, dear. They just came to the door and asked where you were. I said you weren't home, and they asked if they could look around. I was scared, so I just said yes. They found the gun and shirt and then left. I knew it was all nonsense, but I didn't bother going into details. I went upstairs, took a shower, and slept for a couple of hours. For the entire next week, I was busy at work. John Ferry told me that Betty had gone to Allentown and found a lawyer who advised her on how to set me up. John also told me that the lawyer would no longer be advising her. The DNA test results on my shirt came back. There were three different blood samples, mine, Louisa's, and Carlos. The police still didn't have the bodies. It seemed they also spoke to my wife again and asked her about the photographs that supposedly enraged me. She insisted they were with me, but since I denied it, she couldn't prove anything. This meant the police had no motive. The police were trying to build a case based on the shell casings and the bloody shirt, but it was weak. Joe picked me up and took me to Poros. Several important people were waiting for us, but most importantly, there was a new face. I had never seen this guy before, but he exuded authority. Bruno, I'd like to introduce you to Roberto Cuss. Mr. Cuss came from Rhode Island to meet you. Nice to meet you, Mr. Cuss. I haven't met many people from your neck of the woods. Roberto smiled and shook my hand. Yes, but you've already met my brother-in-law, Carlo. Indeed, I have. Sorry for all the trouble I caused him. Oh, don't worry. I'm not upset about his attempt to start a competitive construction company. I told him it was foolish, but he was a hard-working man and thought he could make it despite you. What can I do for you, Mr. Cuss? My sister Louisa is worried. I haven't harmed your sister, and I have no intention of harming her. I know that. She's not afraid of you, Bruno. She told me you were very generous by sending her and Carlo on that Alaskan cruise. She tried to explain the circumstances to me, but I'm afraid it was too complicated to understand. In any case, I appreciate your kindness. Louisa is afraid of your wife, Betty. She said Betty is a ruthless and determined woman who cannot be trusted. I understand. I hope the problem will be resolved in a few days. By the time Carlo and Louisa return home, everything should be under control. I also bought them a new car to make up for the trouble my wife caused. Thank you, Mr. Randazzo. My sister will be glad to hear that. They can return next week. I appreciate your cooperation and look forward to working with you in the future. We all shook hands again, and Joe and I headed to my office. All right, Bruno, now it's time to tell me what the hell is going on. The guy from Rhode Island knows more about this than I do. Joe, you need to keep this secret for a while. I still have a few things to sort out. Betty went to a lawyer in Allentown who told her what to do to get me sent to jail. Then she could divorce me and bypass the prenuptial agreement. 
Carlo and Luisa Kia had been having financial trouble since I pushed them out of business. They were over three months behind on their mortgage and were about to lose their house. Betty somehow found out and went to see them. She agreed to give them enough money to pay off the arrears if Luisa took a few photos of Carlo and Betty having sex. They didn't actually have sex, but the photos made it look like they did. Luisa said Betty put mayonnaise in a ketchup dispenser and squirted it on herself to create the impression that Carlo had ejaculated. Luisa had to keep Carlo awake until they finished taking all the photos. Betty sent the photos to me and I recognized Carlo right away. Then I realized the photos were fake. I went to see Carlo and Luisa and they told me the whole story. You want to shoot them all right? I wasn't sure. The photos looked fake and I just needed to be certain. Luisa got angry when I explained what Betty was trying to do. She didn't like the idea that Betty had set them up to be shot by an angry husband. It wasn't hard to convince them to help me. And does John Ferry know about all this, Bruno? No, but I'll tell him this afternoon. I had to keep him in the dark a bit so he wouldn't get into trouble. What about the blood and shell casings? I told them to take a small bag with them, but to make it look like they weren't going anywhere. Stella from the travel agency booked them tickets to Seattle and a three-week Alaskan cruise. They had plenty of time in Seattle to buy clothes with the $2,000 I gave them for expenses. I took a couple of old couch cushions and shot them about half a dozen times, leaving the shell casings on the kitchen floor. We threw the cushions in the back seat of his Chevy. Carlo and I spent a lot of time convincing Louisa to cut her hand, but she finally did it. The three of us smeared my shirt with the blood. I asked Carlo to sign the car over to me, and then I drove it to my equipment yard in Mount Pin. After we set the car on fire, I drove them to the Philadelphia airport. When I got home, I hid the gun while Betty was watching and put my bloody shirt in a laundry basket. I was pretty sure what she would do next. Joe seemed impressed. People will be talking about this fiasco for a long time, Bruno. I won't say a word until you give me the go-ahead, but I think you'd better bring Ferry up to speed as soon as possible. After Joe left, I went to see John Ferry. The next few days, I was busy with work. The whole situation felt like a boil on the neck. Eventually, it had to burst. It happened on Friday. Betty and I were sitting in the living room enjoying a nice, quiet evening at home. She got up to answer a knock on the door and let in two detectives and six uniformed officers. Bruno, these gentlemen have a search warrant and I had to let them in. She had a smirk on her face that I desperately wanted to wipe off, but instead, I smiled to myself. My wife patiently waited for the police to find what they were looking for and take me back to the station. About ten minutes later, one of the men came down the stairs carrying my wife's Beretta in an evidence bag. I found this, Lieutenant. It was in the nightstand, and it was recently fired. As I stood up, the detective turned to my wife. Betty Randazzo, you are under arrest for the murder of Frankie Donato. You have the right to remain silent. He finished the Miranda rights on the way to the police car. Betty looked at me as if she wanted me to help but didn't know how to ask. I stood in the doorway and watched the patrol cars drive down the street. No lawyer in town would dare to speak to her. Her only hope was a public defender. Frankie Donato had been found in his apartment, shot eight times with a 25 caliber automatic weapon. Only Frankie's and Betty's fingerprints were found in the apartment. On the kitchen table, they found 16 photographs of Betty having sex with an unknown man. Several partial fingerprints were found on the Beretta, and it turned out they were Betty's. Neighbors identified Betty as a frequent visitor to the apartment. No lawyer was willing to speak to her, and no bail bondsman would even consider her case. The next day, Carlo and Luisa returned from their vacation. They called the police to find out why their home was marked as a crime scene in their absence. Shortly after that, John Ferry called and informed me that the charges against me were dropped. Carlo and his wife didn't tell the police more than they had to and refused to answer any questions after the first 10 minutes. They got rid of the police by expressing extreme anger and outrage over the whole situation. The police decided not to cover up the incident. Betty was in jail and only her public defender could talk to her. I came to see her, but she refused to have anything to do with me. Two months later, after a brief trial, Betty was sent to Muni prison for 15 years. She could have been released in eight years for good behavior, but I made sure that would never happen. While Betty was awaiting trial, I founded a new excavation company. It was created to handle small, non-union jobs with non-union employees. I convinced my partners that it would be good for business if we both operated independently but under my control. Materials and other supplies came from my regular suppliers, making everyone happy. Carlo Kia was more than willing to head this new division instead of me. I knew he was a capable man, and I knew I could trust him. One sunny day, there was a knock on the door, and the most beautiful woman I had ever seen appeared on the doorstep. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Cuss. My brother Robert have asked me to come and take care of you. 
Where would you like me to put my bags? By the stairs would be perfect. I had nothing more to say. I just stood there, admiring this goddess while the taxi driver set the luggage on the floor. The driver left with a broad smile and a generous tip. What exactly does that mean? How do you think you should take care of me? But please, my brother, you'd pride yourself of your wife's company. I will take care of your home instead of her. I will accompany you to any social events you need to attend and make sure you are fed and properly dressed. All your needs will be taken care of. That sounds like mothering to me. Did you sleep with your mother? Of course not. Relax, Bruno. Everything will be fine. If anyone asks, I'm just a housekeeper and companion. At night, I am your temptress. If you hurt me, you will die like a small frog on a hot sidewalk. Do you understand? I think I'm in love. Right now, everything is going well for me. Elizabeth and I go to Williamsport every month to visit Betty. Elizabeth enjoys seeing Betty's reaction when we come to visit. Most of the time, Betty refuses to talk to me. She has already filed for divorce while in prison, and I refused. I will remain married to Betty for the rest of my life, but I don't think I will ever live with her again. Every two or three months, she gets into some trouble in Nooney, which extends her sentence. Elizabeth doesn't want to get married. As long as things go smoothly, we will stay together. If at any point she decides to leave, I won't stop her. I have really enjoyed my time with her, and I will remember it forever. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.